thank the Mitchell County Historical Society for um, inviting us to come and give this talk and the Penland School for hosting it. Um, and also Jean McLaughlin for the continued support. I've been talking with her for years and years about opening the post office and she's always got this 100%. Um, I also want to thank our previous board members, yes. Could you speak up a little bit more, please? Oh, yes. Um, I also, uh, I was just thanking the Mitchell County Historic Society, the Penland Post Office, uh, School, and Jean McLaughlin. And I want to thank our previous board members. Um, Geraldine Plato was our chair for uh, four years, and uh, uh, Paula uh, Ferenson was, was uh, very instrumental in helping get the, uh, our project started. Um, and I want to thank our board members who are here today, Jan Hamilton, Laura Shulman, my mom, Marsha Bailey, and uh, Carrie Hedlund <laughs> is here. And I think that's all on our board here today. Um, and uh, I want to thank Rebecca Davis, our postmaster. Um, she's done a great deal of research into the Penland Post Office and has shared a lot of her photos with me, as well as my cousin, Dr. Lloyd Bailey, and my great-great-uncle, um, David Coleman Bailey, who wrote this book. A lot of my information is going to come from those three sources, although I've been uh, uh, scouring the internet for years, uh, coming up with more and more stories about our families. Um, so, onto the post office. This is um, our humble little post office, Penland Post Office and General Store. And this building and the post office inside of it are important threads that have woven together this community and some history of Mitchell, Yancey, Buncombe counties, as well as the greater state of North Carolina. Uh, the Pinland Post Office is the oldest continuously running post office in Western North Carolina. Uh, it was established in 1879, but not in this building. Uh, most of the evidence says this building was built around 1902, but I do have one document saying it was built in 1879, which is right over there. Um, the building, um, and so I'm going to go backward and forward a little bit in history because I wanted to start with the Penlands and Baileys, uh, who came to this area uh, starting in the 1700s and 1800s. I'm not going to go quite back that far, but the Civil War was a very important point uh, in time for them, and they have played pivotal parts in the Civil War history. And none of these stories did I know anything about uh, up until recently. When I grew up um, coming here, to Penland uh, to visit my grandmother who lived next door to the post office. That was Kathleen Bailey, my mom's mother. Um, and my Aunt Louise across the street, my Aunt Mary next to her, who uh, where Elizabeth Brown lives now. Um, the general store was just where I got candy and the railroad tracks was where I put the pennies to get them squashed by the trains. I had no idea that any of this stuff existed. Um, so, um, anyway, um, one of the things that fascinates me most about learning this history is that it's bringing the Civil War and our North Carolina history to life for me. And maybe many of you find the same thing as you dig into your past and find out how these uh, historical events affected your family and how they survived or didn't survive and affected your family. It kind of ignites a bug in you that gets kind of addictive. And so um, I'm really happy to be able to share some of these stories to you tonight. So here are uh, two of my great-great-grandparents. They, they, these two are the ones who built the Penland Post Office building. That's Louise Penland Bailey and Colonel Isaac Hutzel Bailey. This picture was taken in 1914 on top of Little Yellow Ball Mountain over that way. I'll be telling you a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, they had many businesses in, in Penland, and it was called Bailey Station when this, uh, when the Penland Post Office building was built. Um, and I'll discuss those some more later. So I found out some stories that, if not the grace of God or some wonderful fluke, 
Um, I would not be here, and neither would this building. Uh, Colonel Isaac Bailey uh, joined the Confederate Army at the age of 23, or no, 21, and he enlisted um, in the Regiment 58, Company B, that was led by Colonel John Palmer. Um, Almost right away, he was involved in the Battle of Chickamauga. When I grew up, I actually did a report on the Battle of Chickamauga, but I didn't even know he was in it. Um, and as many of you know, it was one of the bloodiest battles in all the Civil War. Um, unfortunately, the Confederates lost 2,301 to death. Uh, 14,000 were wounded. 1,468 were captured or missing. Uh, the Union lost um, 16,000 people. Um, 1,657 were killed, and so on and so forth. Well, he um, he he wrote about uh, Captain uh, Colonel Bailey wrote about the Civil War in 1901, and it became part of this edited. Book uh, that um, I found online, and um, it's mentioned also in this book. Um, and I want to read you how he uh, experienced this war. Just a small part. He wrote it's several pages long. But Captain Bailey fell, almost mortally wounded, leg left leg broken, shot through the right side, and one ear almost severed from his head. Thirteen commissioned officers, including the adjutant, had been killed and wounded. Two-thirds of the right flanking company, to Cap Captain Toby's, having been killed and wounded. And about seven-tenths of the left flanking company, Captain Bailey's. Um, it's amazing that they actually won this battle. Uh, but to think about seven-tenths of his troops dying yet he lived even though he was very greatly wounded. And this person here up there at the top was Colonel Palmer and Captain Toby was, uh, I think, he's <coughs> one of the two down on the right or left. I couldn't figure out quite which one was which. But he also had another harrowing experience at the end of the war. He was in charge of a post in Asheville, including the city jail, which housed a few deserters and Union prisoners of war. A federal detachment took over control of Buncombe County, locking Isaac in the dungeon. He later wrote his brother that he had a bully time trying to save his neck. So uh, unfortunate that he did. Um, this was um, my great great grandmother, Louise uh, Hamlin Bailey. Whoops, I need to go back that far. Um, I think the picture on the left was perhaps around 1888 because if that's my great great no great grandfather Harry, I think that's him. Then he would have been about four in 19 or 1888. Um, Louise grew up in Burnsville inside what is known today as the New Ray Inn. Her parents were Milton Pin Pinkney Pinlin and Althea Coleman Pinlin. And Louise had three sisters and a brother. She and Isaac met when he was in a clerk in her father's general store in Burnsville, although I've not been able to find out what year. She was 11 at the start of the Civil War, and she too had an experience with a bullet. Uh, Milton brought their, bought their home uh, around 1833 from Bacchus Smith, whose son later married one of Louise's older sisters, Cynthia. And uh, Milton, uh, whoops, I can't read my handwriting here. Um, anyway, let's see. Oh, he, uh, by the, uh, at, at one, he had many, many businesses, and he started acquiring land, which later grew to the astonishing amount of 50,000 acres. I don't know what happened with it all. It's gone in history, but uh, for most of it. But he had several grist mills, a tannery, and organized a school for boys and girls. Okay, that's supposed to be this slide. So that's Milton Penland <coughs> and Althea Coleman Penland. Uh, so, what's the rest of here? Um, and uh, 
Oh, I'll tell you about the story about the bullet in a little bit. Um, Althea's uncle, um, I'm going to name drop here, David Lowry Swain, was her mother's brother, and he was a governor of North Carolina for three terms and president of UNC at Chapel Hill until 1867. So he was there uh, through the war. Um, and then her brother, uh, David Coleman, who was a Democrat, was an attorney in Burnsville in 1854 when he defeated Colonel uh, Whitfin, a Whit for state senator. You may know of Whitfin. Whitfin in Asheville is named after him. In 1857, uh, David Coleman defeated Zebulon Vance, who ran on the American Know Nothing ticket. <laughs> uh, that was actually a party for a while, which is it's really amazing to look back over the history of the United States and see when different parties rose and went out of popularity. Um, he later became the governor of North Carolina. Uh, Coleman was a secessionist, and the majority of Nancy County was in favor of secession, but the next year, in, an, in a different election, he lost to Vance. And uh, I guess Vance only lost that one election in his whole life, and that was to David Coleman the first time. So here is the picture of, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't see very well without good light, but... Um, we can put those on. Put those well, on. I think it might be hard to see the pictures, yeah. so I'd rather you all see the pictures so you can bear with And Alicia, the very first Pamela Post Office is in that picture. Right, but I'm not sure which building it is. It's one of them. That's right. The Penlands? I wonder which one it's based on. While they were having it, their, their house in Burnsville, they owned this estate at Flat Rock. And this photo shows what could be slave quarters because, unfortunately, uh, the Penlands had 31 slaves. Uh, Flat Rock, though, was where the first Penland Post Office was established in 1879 by Isaac Stewart. He had a store somewhere here in Flat Rock. Well, Flat Rock, as many of you may know, is just like if you go down this road, take a right on the highway, and take the next right. It's right in there. Um, most of these buildings are gone. I think there's still a log cabin here that uh, Milton, the son, lived in. Anyway, um, the next um, postmaster at this time, at this place. Oh, when Isaac Stewart applied for the post office, he wanted to call it Penland Rock Post Office, but the government decided no, they just wanted it to be Penland Post Office. The second postmaster was Becky's great, great, great grandmother. grandmother, two greats, Harriet Hensley. And she ran the post office from somewhere in this area as well. So on to the next story. So there's the new right in. I, from what I understand, the addition, this is bigger than what it was when Milton and Althea ran it as an inn. Um, it was smaller, but I took that picture, of, I took these pictures off the website because there's a bedroom there and here's the story. I heard two stories. Oh wait, I have to back up a second, sorry. Um, so in 1861, um, the, all the neighboring states to North Carolina had seceded from the Union. And so there was a lot of pressure, and Abraham Lincoln had made a requirement that the states who were still in the Union would have to donate soldiers and arms. Well, North Carolina said no. And uh, I mean, it was, it was actually a back and forth. There were pro-secession and anti-secession. Well, Yancey County elected Milton Penland to represent Yancey County and go to Raleigh and he placed the vote to secede Yancey County from the Union. And that was in May of 20 of 1861. Um, so then I heard two stories about why Milton Althea actually ended up selling the inn after the war and leaving Burnsville. One night, revelers celebrated in Bailey Square. The next morning, a bullet was found in the wall of Louise's bedroom. 
which was directly above the front entrance. Renegade bushwhackers had been drinking whiskey and firing off shots. And that was uh, a story that my uncle told me, and it's reported in this story. I mean, in this book. Um, another story I heard was um, my cousin Lloyd Bailey told me that in 1864, Union sympathizers took Milton out of town and put a rope around his neck. They said he didn't give them eight head of cattle, 100 pounds of bacon, 50 pounds of wheat, and leave the country. They would hang him. So they left. Um, and I don't know what day or year they actually moved from Ash uh, moved, moved to Asheville, but when they did, they bought the house of Mayor Milton Elias on Battery Park Hill, which now, where today stands the Battery Park Park Hotel. Um, and then around 1867, Milton and Althea sold their inn to Garrett and Elizabeth Ray, who uh, they eventually turned it into um, the new Ray Inn. So this is a picture of Isaac and Louise, and there's three sons. Um, Milton is right behind them. Harry, that's my mom's grandfather, and Charlie. And this is on top of that, it's called yellow ball, right? Little yellow ball. Little ball. Little ball. Little ball. And they, they made this plaque for him um, that says uh, he was one of the very few who early recognized the marvelous future of the country about you. And uh, that was in 1914, and 400 people climbed that hill with him. And my son and I went up there two years ago with Dean Bean on a, a, uh, one of those ATV things. And it shook us so hard going up there. It took us hours. And we got up to the top. It was like May or something. It was freezing up there, and our teeth were about to fall out. <laughs> um, and so I cannot even imagine 400 people climbing up there, but they used to keep cattle up there in the summer and then in the winter when it started snowing. Well, this is the view up there. It's very beautiful. Um, so our three relatives survived the Civil War, and, uh, and I'm glad they did. <laughs> um, this is a picture of the Bakersfield County Courthouse, and to the right of it, is it's kind of washed out but there's a sign that says George M. Young and this is one of the stores that um, um, Colonel Isaac ran um, and this was in Bakersville and after the war uh, Louise and Isaac got married in 1975 in Asheville they lived there for a little while then they moved to Bur Bakersville Pardon? Did I say 19? Yeah. I'm sorry. I have a little bit of dyslexia, so sometimes, thank you for correcting me. Uh, 1875, they got married, and then they ended up living in Bakersfield for a while and running this store um, with George Young. Um, and then they moved to Bailey Station around 1890, but kept their house in store. Um, so, in, and I'm going to go a little bit forward in time here. In 1904, Louise Bailey had an idea for a school, and I read that in this book. Um, the Seven Springs Farm and Industrial School, where Wesley Conley was one of the trustees. And this is Wesley Conley. I was very excited to get that picture. I think he's a very charming, handsome man. Um, and by 1910, the Baileys donated land to create the school, and by 1910, Conley opened it to students. When his older brother, who was teaching there, tragically died, Conley sold the school to the Bishop Corner of Asheville, who hired Rufus Morgan to run the school. They changed the name to the Appalachian Industrial School. Morgan's sister Lucy arrived in 1920, 1920 and established the Penman School of Crafts in 1929 alongside the Appalachian School, which I think closed around 1964. Is that kind of correct? You guys probably know this history better than me. Yeah. So um, the land 
was donated by the Baileys um, and had that connection. So here's a really cool picture. This is part of yeah. Becky's cool. Yes. The, the last picture? Yes. Is that the farmhouse? Yeah, yeah. The farm? that's the farmhouse. Yeah. It is. Yes. The farmhouse. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The picture before this. No. This no, one is that's the farmhouse. Farm right. Yeah. Back. Yeah. Well, isn't that one right over there? Yeah. 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 It's still standing, right? Yeah. Okay. Good question. So this is from Becky's collection, and she told me that this is a picture of surveyors surveying for the railroad. To be and built through Penland. To be built through Penland, and it was downriver or downriver a little ways past Penland, right? It's uh, where the Conley houses are at. Mm, the Conley houses. Conley. Cat Conley. 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 Oh, oh, oh where Cat Conley is. Let me. This is for her, her relatives down by the railroad track. Right. Mm -hmm. Those houses that are there. <clears throat> yeah. So men, some of you might know where that is. Uh, I've been over that way too. And I find it very interesting because I hardly ever see pictures of black people in uh, Western North Carolina at this time. So I think there's at least four of them there in the rest of white, mm -hmm. looks like, doing survey, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so this is a picture, I do not know what year this was taken. Do you? Well, I was, it, before the 1916 flood, I'm thinking around 1912. This might be 1912. But this, uh, that is the Bailey Lumber Company, right straight ahead. And to the left is the depot. The train depot is to the left there. And up there um, is the house that my mom grew up in, up on the hill, uh, which is no longer there. But um, it, it, we, I found a picture, this picture, whoops, stop. That's the side view, and that is Harry Bailey Sr. and Harry Bailey Jr. So um, it could be that they were living there um, in 1900, but that he's in this picture, it must have come after 1960. Okay. So the Baileys had many companies in Hamlet. Uh, here is a partial list. Um, the Blue Ridge Mining Company, the Pinland Feldspar and Pinland Company, two sawmills, drugstore, dynamite, explosives, sawmill, blacksmithing, welding, windmills, casket shop. It's almost exhausting looking at all this list that they could do. They, but I, I heard stories that, they, that Louise and Isaac were just absolutely full of energy. Um, they were nonstop when they visited David Coleman as a son, as a, as a young, their grandson, um, person who read that book, um, they visited him and his family in New York and they would just go out every day and see all the sites and come back and be ready to go. So here's a picture of the mixed train unloading freight and mail at Finland in 1916. Here's another picture from Becky's archives in, uh, I don't know, Alton Pass. In Alton Pass. Here's a picture of uh, my Aunt Virginia and Aunt Mary. They're one of these kids. These are some kids from Pam Hamlin and possibly like Joanne's parents running around. That, that those babies, the, the other babies. <laughs> Okay, this picture is really interesting to me because it has a lot going on in it. Over on the left is the dam, and the very left is the Carolina Mica Mill Company. Over here is the swinging bridge, the foot bridge. Um, the post office, or what still was then, was the Bailey Lumber Company building, is over here on the left on this side of the tracks. The depot is next to that, an unidentified house, and then across the tracks is Carolina Mercantile, and the Mica Company house, and then a couple buildings, two or three buildings, we don't know what they are. 
But we're pretty certain this is, this was before the flood of 1960, before the flood. Yeah. So as an historian, you get caught on these little details. But I want to show you this next picture. I will be detectives. This is a more of a close-up, and if you notice, um, there's the depot. Um, you can't see the house that's next to it. And the buildings across have pointy roofs, and they're not white. Whereas in the picture we just looked at, huh. so I'm not sure what happened there. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know which came first because you would think that a building that was like this would be older than a building with a flat roof. But these look like there's more going on in this picture, which I would think meant it came. I think this one came first. You came. You think? I think so. It's hard to say. Well, look, that one building's missing in this one. And it's in the other one, uh, right beside the train depot, on the right of the train Well, it could be covered up by that tree, though. But as you can see, and this is fascinating to me, too, because I, I didn't know any of this existed, but there's the tracks, and then they have little, um, they have little walkways across the tracks. Yeah, they took the horse and wagon underneath those. Yeah, there's a, there's a road, which we'll, we'll see in some are, are, are those trees behind that, those houses not in the picture in the other picture with the flat? I don't think they are. Let's see. I don't know. Yeah, they're cut down. But you can see that. You can see that swinging bridge. So they might have been because they grew up real fast and they're not in all the pictures. This is a later picture. Yeah. This is the later picture, and this is the earlier picture. Well, so those trees are there, and you would let out. So, yeah, somehow they must have chopped the roofs off for some reason. I don't quite get it, but. OK, here's a different angle. Um, this, this, this is the, this is the post office building. Um, and this, I think, is the Micah. That's the, uh, the Micah Mr. Office. Bell's office building. The, the, mining, the, mining, the Carolina Mica Mill. And I think this is the Carolina Mercantile. And uh, and you can see there was another piece of track there for cars that's not there anymore. That's before the 1916 flood. Right, it's the original bridge. Right. We're going to be seeing some of the aftermath of the flood here. Um, here is a picture of the Carolina Mercantile. It's hard to read, but the sign does say Carolina Mercantile and Papa Storm before the flood. I wish that person wasn't blurry. But... And Papa would have been uh, Alan Mr. Uh, Pittman. Mr. Tanner. Mr. Tanner. Andrew Tanner. And I'm so glad you get me keep on track. Here's a, a picture of the Carolina Mica Mill, which, if you remember, it was up the river close to the dam. You can see the dam picture. Here's one during the winter when the river gets partially frozen. Mm. And it's covered in snow. Uh, another angle. This is the this is the post office building. I think this is my aunt's house. And there's a mysterious house that's no longer there. And this is the line mill. It's not the pen that will play the picture to have to slot the back. Yeah. Here's another angle, the, the Micah Mill, the office, uh, and here's the, here's the Inland Post Office building, the depot, Carolina Mercantile, the play was deep. Was it the post office at that time? The post office was actually in uh, I'll back up a second here. Um, the post office was in one of these buildings across the railroad track. In 1902, it moved there. Um, and it didn't move into the building until 1934. Uh, but a lot of the original fixtures moved around from different locations. Um, there's a picture of the dam closer up with the Michael Mill right there. 
No, that's before 1916. Right, yeah, we have to have to flood yet. Um, there's two people in the middle of that river, and that looks dangerous. <laughs> I've never seen that. They're standing on the rocks on the dam. That just looks scary to me. <laughs> and that's the high school. Okay, this one is also a puzzle because I can't quite figure this out. If this is the dam, then that's on the wrong side of the river, but I, have, I flipped it and looked at it, but it didn't look right that way. So I don't know if there was something on that side of the river at one point. Do you know? The other side of the river. That, that's not the mic mill, it doesn't have the same shape. Well, one of those unsolvable mysteries at this point. Okay, here's the flood. Okay. It's coming. <laughs> Here it's coming. It rained and it rained and it rained and it rained and July 16th, 1916. That's the dam. That's the beginning of the flood. This is after the flood, and that's Harry Bailey Sr. sitting next to, I'm not sure what building. Here's another picture. This was the office of the Carolina Mineral Company. I'm not sure who that person is, but it moved. Um, show them something, Natalie. Yes. Do you see how? When the flood happened, it took one side and the back out of all those buildings and all the contents and washed them away. And you can see it missing. Mm -hmm. See wow. the side and the back's missing. Wow. <laughs> and in this building, it washed away the cast iron safe and all the silver dollars for payroll. It's never been found. <laughs>
And who was the fellow that went across the footbridge and then it just washed away and wound up staying at your grandmother's house? Yeah. Do you remember who he was? Um, he went over to get him some tobacco and he couldn't go back for three weeks. It was <laughs> Bailey's father. Oh, really? Um, yeah, Fly Bailey. Uh, yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Crazy people. Um, he had to have his tobacco and he ran right across that bridge and it was uh, oh, gone. It was hitting underneath and it did. It just washed it out and he was stranded. Oh. On the other side, we lived on that side. Uh oh. <laughs> and it was about <laughs> three weeks. <laughs> but he had tobacco. He had tobacco. I forgot about that. <laughs> Um, so this this uh, low water bridge, I think, I think this must have been after the 1916 because that truck looks older than 1916 kind of truck. Yeah, that bridge wasn't even built in 1916. Okay. That low water bridge. Yeah. But Mom's friend Joanne Bailey was practicing her driving with a friend, with a friend and they drove off the bridge into the river. <laughs> And uh, all the men just jumped up and ran over there and pushed it out. <laughs> um, I don't know who these people are, but I just think this is so romantic. I love that. I, I just love that picture. And that, that bridge was there up until, what, the 60s or the 70s, right? Because I remember it. 70s. 70s. Early 70s. Because when we go up on first off, it was there. Um, and I'm not sure what year this is, but that's a really cool. That other picture was one of Mr. Tainer's. Okay, Andrew Tainer. A lot of those were his pictures. Okay. Uh, okay. Greg Conley and myself, we went to see his daughter in the rest home, and he, she let us have his picture out. Those are his old pictures. Wow. Uh, so that picture of the two on the bridge could have been the original swimming bridge. It's nice. Yeah. So, um, and here is... Um, and, it, and notice how straight that chimney is. Yeah. <laughs> it's not anymore. <laughs> well, notice there is no mailbox and no flagpole. Oh, okay. that, that was taken when I was a little girl. This Robert Duncan. Yeah. Okay. Robert, side porch. Robert Duncan. He's the storekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I do know. Uh, Robert Duncan was the postmaster in a original store. In 1962, for about a year and a half. He was an interim postmaster. Right before Carlene. He, he was, was an interim postmaster. Oh, right. Right before Carlene. And I worked for Carlene. And you worked for Carlene. Mm -hmm. Then there used to be a side porch. Yes. It wrapped around the entire, yeah, it wrapped around the building. Yeah. Yeah. It's in some of those pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and this is Paula Miller, but a grocery, but I don't know when that was. I couldn't find a date for that. Um, when I first started working there, his wife had taken over the store. He passed away. So, um, Paul had it in the uh, yeah, early 60s. Early 60s. Okay. I thought she changed her logo right around that time. No, Robert's oh, 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 yeah, well, had it in the early 60s, sir. Oh, well, Paul Miller had it later. He had it in Bill Brown's night. Fuck me, he was your father. He was there. Charles Edwards' grocery, and I, that, that photo actually has a uh, down in the corner, it says Doug Long, uh, September 28, 1967. Okay. So. Charles bought the store from Jesse, I do believe. Charles has bought the store from Jesse. Jesse Miller. Yeah. Um, these are very old boxes, the American Eagles. And Becky uh, thinks that there is only one other set in the country, and it's in the Smithsonian. So these are one of the pride and joys of our little post office. Um, and all of those boxes are random and still in use. Wow. <laughs> that is so cool. Um, oh, there's that sign. Someone stole our sign off the tree farm building. There it is. Yes, and I'll pay a reward if I anybody finds it. It's okay, up there for a long time. Um, so I want to bring this up to the, this his, the, the, the history 
of this century. Um, and I'm starting with this little building because it was a gift to our nonprofit project. Um, and there was a, a, an auspicious moment. My mom met Dr. Dan Barron in the Ingalls grocery store one day, and they were talking about the Penman Post Office project. I think this was around 2009 or 10. And they decided that they would have a meeting of the community to see about fixing this building. Um, and so there was a meeting with about 30 people, and, and it whittled down to about 10. And they began meeting and meeting. And thanks to Gloria and Geraldine, we, we got our nonprofit status. Me and, and, and other people on our committee. Right? No. The nonprofit? The nonprofit okay, status. Non yeah. <laughs> okay. Historical No, that's a different part. Mom and I started in the year 2000 trying to get our family to get this doggone oak tree off the back of the building. And nobody but Mom and me and Cindy, her cousin, thought it was worth saving. They uh, wanted it just to let it die because they thought it was a hazard. And we kept at them and kept at them and kept at them like Chinese water torture. And they finally agreed that they would give us the building, this building, this building, and the post office building, um, and the land under it. And at, after we got the nonprofit status, and finally we got the, the ownership last October. Oh. Yeah. And in the meantime, uh, we got it also on the National Historical Registry. And that took a long time. I worked on it a lot. Mom and her cousin Cindy paid a professional to finish it up because it was a complicated process. And we got that status in 2012. Now I'm going to say, thank you for And then as soon as we got the, uh, the ownership, um, after dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings, we hired someone to dismantle the back of the building that had been absolutely crushed to pieces by that giant oak tree. They removed the oak, got rid of that, dismantled. I'm sad to say the shed is not there anymore. If we raise the money, we could rebuild it. But for now, the main part of the building that needs help is the old general store part. And we've hired Buck Pollard. He came in in January. And first thing he did was he put some stabilizing beams from the bank to the north wall. Because it's the north wall that's having the trouble. It doesn't have a foundation underneath it. And so uh, he approached our com committee, our board, and said uh, that he could do it for this much money. He would uh, stabilize that north wall. And this was a prayer answered because there have been many nights where I've laid awake going, oh my God, are we going to get this building stabilized before it collapses so that we can raise enough money to actually do the whole renovation. So just stabilizing it is a huge breath of fresh air to have that happen. And then um, he put beams in the inside and jacked them up. That north wall had sunk about 18 to 20 inches lower than the rest of the floor. Um, this is what it looked like in 2010. And as you can see, it slopes. Um, by, by 2016, the slope was more dramatic. And I, don't, I couldn't find any of those pictures. But he, uh, he came in and um, well, you'll see in the next picture, it's pretty different. Um, he took out the floor, he put in those beams, and it's, it's now not going to move. The peak of the building was starting to separate. All those beams up there. And now they're coming back together, and he's notching them together. Um, here's a back view from the front door looking into the back. And as you can see, it's a very long building. It's 50 feet 
to that back wall there, and it's 30 feet wide. Um, and I have a plan of the old general store, what, what, where the shelves and whatnot they had right over there if you want to see that. That's what it looks like right now. So as you can see, about half the floor is exposed, um, and then the beams, the supporting beams are in place. This is the old foundation, which just absolutely tickles me. I just think it's amazing that this building that was built 116 years ago had these things made out of logs, and they're sitting on top of rocks. Can you see the rocks there? Mm -hmm. um, and it's standing. It's stood for this much time, and it will continue with your help. Um, so this is a very special photo. And does anybody guess who? Does anybody know who that lady is in the middle? <laughs> you do. Becky. It's Becky. <laughs> and it was taken by a photographer, John Menendez, who made a name for himself in 1977 or 78. That one was the Penland Furniture Company. And that was the last company to uh, rent out that side of the building. Here is another picture of our beloved postmistress who is with us today. And she will have worked there for 50 years next year. Mm -hmm. Here is uh, our little um, sign that we have. And this is one of my favorite pictures because it shows the community, part of the community that has helped get us to this point. We've raised over $50,000 so far. We've spent about most of it. <laughs> and we've got a website. We've got an online uh, fundraising program that we're going to encourage you to go to. You can also put money in an envelope uh, that Gloria just made for us hot off the press. Um, we um, also have a website, and you can go to the website um, directly and find out more stories, more information. You can donate there. You can also donate. We have a, a <coughs> online campaign is generosity.com. Uh, and then when you go to that one, uh, it has um, you just put in in the post office. Uh, we also um, are looking for products and services because we're going to do an online auction next March. Um, we also have a big pile of, of old barn wood taken out from the project that uh, can be turned into um, frames, picture frames. I saw some in the store the other day for fifty dollars. So if we could get uh, any craftsperson here who could make us some picture frames and we can put them on the online auction to make money. Um, you can sign up for our e-newsletter. It's the papers going around. Uh, we do have a Facebook page, uh, which I find is very funny that we're using the internet to promote a post office. But we also, um, the more people know about us, the more the net casts wide because Historic preservation is challenging. Um, there's so many other causes out there that are so worthy and that really pull on the heartstrings more like starting people. Um, and, and historic preservation typically gets the low end of the totem pole when people are giving out money to make things happen. Um, so we also, uh, we're, we're going to start cleaning up and painting the office that little office, it's in good shape, and we hope to be able to rent that out to uh, a local business person. We also need leads on a potential business for the uh, general store part of the building because um, we, the more we have a clear idea of who's going to be in there, the easier it is to get funding and the easier it is to convince the inspector that uh, that what we're doing in the building for the lowest price possible just to keep it going 
uh, is the right fit uh, for the codes that he's demanding that we live up to. So getting leads, um, I keep thinking of like a, a, a rafting business or something can do very well there. But it's such a big space that even two or three businesses could possibly fit in there. Um, so the rest of the things that we need to do to the building, um, after we get it stabilized, um, it might not be that big of a project. Um, and we're hoping to finish up this, this part within thirty dollars to $40,000. We have about $15,000 right now. We've applied for some grants. Um, and then we need to change out the electric. Uh, knob in, it's old knob and tube. And we need to update that. Um, and then we need to, to do some ceiling work and some roof work and some window and door work. But you know, all that's like not that huge of an issue. Um, so, I don't know, I think that's, I'm coming to the end of my story here. And I want to thank everyone for coming. Alicia, what's the status of the renovation now? There doesn't seem to be a whole lot going on down there this summer. Right. Um, uh, the story is Buck was chugging along. He was about a week and a half away. We had discussed permits beforehand. He decided, he or he thought we didn't need permits because he's done bigger projects that didn't need permits for that kind of work. Well, mm -hmm. Tommy saw it, stopped, looked. Stop so then we had to pay for an engineer. The engineer, uh, his plans are a bit drastic. So we're consulting an architect who is above an engineer um, for help uh, to see if there's any wiggle room to kind of bring some of those costs back down because uh, it went from a $5,000 project to finish to $30,000. So, so you have to have the plans from an architect before you can before we can pull permits. So, but we're really close. I've been negotiating in negotiations right now uh, with all the people, and we have uh, Jennifer Cathy of the Historic Preservation um, Office, who's on our team, and she's advocating for us. And the most important thing right now is to button it up because winter's coming, and we don't want the openness to allow more of the weather to come in. Sounds good to me. <laughs> this winter? I know. <laughs> so, here we'll get to the last. So, just to reiterate, re re um, the Phillips Family Foundation, that's one, one uh, group that we didn't, uh, that I uh, think was in my notes here somewhere, because they were the first people to give us a grant. And we were able to hire Joe Offerman, who is a uh, historic preservation architect. And he did our plans, which you can see online on our website, um, which enabled us to apply for more grants. And it also encouraged us in that this building was a worthwhile building to save and that it was doable. That because, uh, frankly, I've, I've talked to over a dozen contractors got getting prices from, oh, it'll take you $100,000 to half a million to it's not worth it, knock it down. Mm -hmm. So it was very nice to get this professional who's been in the business many, many years who said, this is a worthwhile building to save and it's definitely doable. So, any other questions? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us.